Hello, my name is Renee, and today we will be discussing the signaling learning principle in student engagement. Particularly, we will be examining the, sing the strengths and weaknesses of the signaling learning principle and how they impact student engagement. So it is necessary to understand what influences student engagement. Student engagement is the key idea for the classroom because students who are engaged with the learning with the material are more likely to learn in the classroom. So it is necessary mm -hmm. for instructors mm -hmm. to understand what impact different items or different learning principles have on student engagement in order to best incorporate them in the classroom properly. So before we get into the specifics of the signaling learning principle, it's important to understand what student engagement looks like and then what the signaling learning principle is based off of. So student engagement is part of success. So students who are engaged in the classroom are more likely to be successful than students who are disengaged in the classroom. So engagement plus learning equals success. So students who are engaged are students who are more likely to be learning and then students, these students who are learning and comprehending the material, understanding it, are more likely to be successful because not only will they be able to recall the information better, but they will be able to imply the information. So these are the key aspects of success, not only remembering, but using the information and being able to build on that for new information and new knowledge at either in the same classroom or at a later date. So what does engagement in the classroom look like? So students who are engaged typically are answering questions or they have their hand raised or they are interacting with the lesson material, they're interacting with the teacher and they're participating in the learning activities such as the homework, quizzes, any kind of activities in the classroom. So these students are engaged with the learning process and in order to encourage engagement, the, the instructor needs to be able to adapt different learning principles and learning theories and learning styles to be able to get as many students engaged in the classroom as possible. What the instructor does not want to do is they do not want to discourage engagement. So it's important, it's equally important to understand what makes students frustrated and what causes them to disengage with the learning material. So that way that the instructor can alter their lesson plans in order to better create a healthy and stable learning environment. So how can the signaling learning principle help to encourage student engagement? Well, the signaling learning principle is part of the multimedia learning principles. So it's important to understand kind of what multimedia is before looking at the learning principles that are associated with it. So multimedia is a form of communication. So multimedia is how you kind of communicate with students and teachers, students and students, or outside the classroom as well. People use multimedia um, in the work environment, in their personal lives. So multimedia is just using any kind of media and communicating with other people. So using more than one kind of media to communicate. And so this relates to anything from pen, paper, traditional lecture style classrooms. And these all are old types of multimedia. So traditionally, modern multimedia refers to the use of digital media in the classroom. So digital media can be anything from the traditional PowerPoint slideshow presentation in front of the classroom to convey content and learning material or activities information. So this is a form of communication between the instructor and the students. And this is a very good form of multimedia presentation because it helps to provide information, activities, and gets the student engaged with the material. Other forms of multimedia would be the use of a video tutorial or kind of a how-to video to teach students how to do something or provide students with information about how something was created. So any type of video streaming site that would have these kind of how-to videos or even a video that was filmed by the instructor and provided for the students or by the students themselves and provided for each other. This would qualify as multimedia because the student is filming the visual, most likely there the audio included in the 
included in the video in order to help and to encourage learning for their classmates or for the student curriculum in general. Now, a newer form of digital media technology that is being used as a multimedia device is the use of mobile devices such as cell phones or tablets in the classroom. So these devices are being used to encourage learning because they are this is technology that students are familiar with and so they have applications, educational applications that can be used for encouraging learning with devices that students are familiar with or devices that they have and are regularly using to begin with and so they can continue to use them through an educational activity. So it's important to understand how these different types of multimedia work that way instructors can adapt them for student learning needs. So they can encourage engagement by using multimedia. But it's important to to know how to use multimedia properly so that engagement, student engagement is high throughout the classroom and students are not disengaged through the educational experience. Now, one way to learn how to use multimedia, multimedia devices and multimedia technology in the classroom efficiently is to understand the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. So the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, excuse me, is a learning theory that was developed by Richard Mayer. Richard Mayer is an American educational psychologist, and he developed these multimedia learning theories as a way to explain to people how to best use multimedia or how to better create a more engaging learning environment for students, faculty, educational administrators, whoever is existing in the educational frame. So this could be education in the traditional school, traditional schooling, or education in the workplace. So wherever education is occurring, these multimedia learning principles can apply. So the basis of the multimedia learning principle is that people learn better through information provided with text and visuals. So a combination of these two things. Now the visuals and the text can come in different formats, but basically these learning principles say that by having them together, learning occurs more readily. And the secondary base for this is that all of these learning principles were based off of the cognitive learning theory. The cognitive learning theory is a learning theory that was developed based on the idea that people have a limited space in the working memory. So the memory that is also the short-term memory, or what some people call short-term memory, is your working memory. So you can pull from it immediately and kind of use that information. So cognitive, th cognitive learning theory basically implies that you have limited space there. And so in order to help to ease that space in order to make sure it doesn't get overloaded or you don't deal with cognitive overload, information should be created and provided in an efficient way to help the working memory process it and move it into the long-term memory. So it's important to understand kind of the cognitive learning theory and the cognitive theory of multimedia learning in order to understand kind of how we're going to apply that to the signaling learning principle. So let's let's look at an example of how to utilize the cognitive learning theory and how it works best in the learning environment. So we're going to be looking at a picture and text example. So the text will be narration. So we are going to be looking at Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. So this painting was created in the 1490s, so sometime between 1490 and 1500 is when this painting was thought to have been finished. And so this is a painting of the Last Supper, so Christ is the Last Supper. So this is the moment in time when Christ is telling his disciples that one of them will betray him. And this scene has Christ and his 12 disciples, so you have the 12 disciples from left to right. So we have Bartholomew, on the very left, then we have James, the son of Alphaeus, Andrew, and then we have the grouping next to them. We've got Judas Iscariot, we've got Simon Peter, John the Evangelist, then right in the center is Christ, 
and then to the left of them or to the right of them we have Thomas James the Greater Philip and then at the very right side of this particular this particular painting we've got Matthew Jude Thaddeus and then Simon the Zealot so this information that you're hearing as you're looking at this particular painting is easier for you to remember because you can apply what I am saying to the visual images that you're looking at. So this is the basis of the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Now if I had just described this particular painting to you and told you all of that information, it would be harder for people to remember. It would be harder for students to remember. So it is important when you're when people are providing information to provide a visual along with it that would help to kind of mesh the information together. Mm -hmm. So help it kind of go together with everything in general. So then how does the signaling learning principle apply to all this? Where does the signaling learning principle come in with the cognitive theory of multimedia learning? So the signaling learning principle basically states that signaling or cueing is the means of using text, pictures, gestures, or other eye movements to guide learners' attention to essential learning material. Instructors use the signaling learning principle fairly regularly without always understanding what it is and without meaning to, generally. So they use it through gestures at the slide that they're presenting, or they use it with inflection to say what is more important, such as if you're listening to a documentary film, the narrator possibly will be using inflection in his voice to indicate important or significant moments. So signaling learning principle is a fairly significant learning, learning principle and is one that is used most commonly with multimedia learning. So how does the signaling learning principle apply to interpreting images with text and, and that sort of learning. So the signaling learning principle utilizes this kind of like hand gesture types of thing. It uses eye movements. It uses pictures. So traditionally teachers, even at the podium in front of the kind of chalkboard, these would be teachers that would be using the signaling gesture to motion towards information at the chalkboard behind them. So the signaling learning mm -hmm. principle has been around for a while, but Richard Meyer, Richard Mayer developed how it should be used with multimedia. So what constitutes signals? And we are going to be looking at with the old picture we just looked at again. So we are back with the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. So what constitutes a signal? So I, as the instructor, could point to particular significant parts of this particular painting, such as I could indicate the center, the focal point of this painting as Christ in the very center of the image. That would be a use of the signaling learning principle. Or I could gesture in the general area. Or another option would be to use animations or to use lines drawn on the image, such as these lines drawn here to signify the linear perspective occurring to help guide the viewer's attention to the focal point of the painting. A secondary way to utilize the signaling learning principle would be to incorporate a space bubble, so a way to help guide a viewer's attention to a particular area. So if I wanted to discuss something in this area, such as Christ as the focal point, I could add a graphic animation on top of the picture to help to guide viewers' attention. Now, a second or another way to incorporate the signaling learning principle would be to just add a zoomed in feature to the work. So you could take a zoomed in version of the image. So we have a version here where we have a group of three of the apostles. We have Judas Iscariot, Simon Peter, and John the Evangelist. And this is a grouping of the apostles. It gives students a closer view of kind of what who they are and if we were discussing this particular principle. Other one, we've got Christ in the center, we've got the focal point. So this is a good way to 
bring attention to particular places in an image. So if you if this instructor was utilizing a graph, the instructor could point to a significant part of the graph or zoom in on that part of the graph. So that students are basically eh, basically learning the information and giving a and reducing the information for the cognitive load so that students are focusing on what exactly they need to focus on. Now, we're going to look at the advantages of signaling. What does signaling do for the students? What, how does this help them to learn? So some of the advantages are guide points. So we looked at the guide points. So signaling learning principle provide guide points for students to be able to help them to identify significant parts in an image. So in this particular one, we looked at this, we're looking at this again, I could utilize the signaling learning principle to provide guide points for to be able to look at each of the individual apostles or the different parts of the image that are important to understand. So such as the focal point in the very center, this is a guide point. This helps students to focus on this individual section without straining the mental faculties basically so this is helping to ease cognitive load by pointing out this is where this this is where the focal point is students should be able to easily identify it because of signaling utilizing this guide point other one other ones easily to organize information so this is an easy way to organize information because i provided the information earlier on to which apostle was which and so I can then point to each individual apostle and say this particular, this particular apostle here is Judas Iscariot, this one is Simon Peter, this one is John the Evangelist. So this helps people to break down information in a way that it can be built on top of, which is part of the constructivist learning theory. So information is provided in a way that students can easily organize it and then build from it saying it's like oh if this information was provided and then I can mesh these information this information together and then we can build from that information so signaling learning principle allows students to easily integrate information that has been previously provided so they so students can add information together in order to come up with the final information that is needed for this particular learning problem. Now those two things together basically indicate that this will reduce the cognitive load for students. So students will not have to work as hard with the signaling learning principle. So they will be provided with information in small bite-sized bits and guide with guide points and easily to organize so that they can process the information more efficiently and integrate the information together so that it can eventually work its way into the long-term working, the long-term memory, so long-term working memory. So these are the advantages of the signaling learning principle. And so it's important to kind of understand how these advantages work and how this works and what has been proven to work for the signaling learning principle. So what has been proven to work? So Visual and verbal cues for the signaling learning principle have been proven to work. So visual and verbal cues typically indicate that there are, there are verbal cues that people utilize for the signaling learning principle, such as voice inflection, vocal change, or anything in that particular category. But there are also visual cues. So visual cues um, visual cues can be from pointing at the screen, like the instructor pointing at the screen, like me over here, pointing at the screen where all this and while all the information is, or can utilize other tools such as circling an important part of the circling an important part or highlighting it or anything in that particular area. Now, part of the part of the verbal and visual cues exist are the explicit and implicit cues. So explicit cues 
are cues that have been that have been constructed for you while implicit cues are ones that you're going to use yourselves so the difference would be some something the teacher providing a working material that has been highlighted pre-highlighted versus sing versus um, working material that you as a student will highlight yourself so this is the difference between these particular cues and so these help to guide students to particular types of information so a verbal cue could be as we discussed um, watching a documentary watching a documentary film and the narrator is using inflection in their voice to add emphasis or you will hear in my voice where I am adding emphasis to particular words in order to help students to key in on these particular words such as signaling learning principle so the Verbal cues are signaling kind of what is important for students to understand. The visual cues are broader in terms and they are more um, adaptable because they can be added to the any types of materials such as you can use highlighting and to highlight text, working text, you can use you can use the circle functions, you can use the gestures to point to significant learning material. So visual cues are more common, but verbal cues are use, are have been used as well. And there are and studies by Richer have proven that these particular learning cues work best when they are combined together. And so a visual cue and a verbal cue work best together. So not only do the narration, but also do a type of visual cue, such as a zoom in on a picture or a highlighted text. So these particular learning principles are should be utilized together in order to encourage student learning and student engagement. So a teacher who is utilizing inflection and who's utilizing different different sounds and different kind of vocal inflections to cue in students to important words are more likely to engage students than teachers who are speaking in a flat voice. And the same goes for a student or a teacher who is gesturing towards an important place in a work. So the inflection and the gesture work better to encourage student engagement and the engaged student in the subject. Now, what are the disadvantages? So every learning principle and every learning theory tend to have disadvantages because learning is not an exact science. Every single learner is different. Every single learning situation is different. So we as educators have to be able to navigate these differences in order to best create a learning environment for our students. So one disadvantage for, this, for the signaling learning principle comes with the question of how much is too much? There haven't really been a whole lot of studies about how much signaling is too much, but basically this kind of reverts to cognitive overload. So how much signaling is too much? And the secondary issue is the issue of redundancy. So redundancy relates to what happens if you are dealing with students who have a high prior knowledge of the subject matter that you were teaching them. So if students have a high prior knowledge, if they are well informed of the subject, typically signaling learning principle might be a bit irritating for them. So it's important to understand these disadvantages in order to understand kind of how they impact student engagement. So how much is too much? So we are going to look at the example. So we're looking at the Last Supper again. So how much signaling is too much signaling for this particular image? So if we had one signal here to point to a significant area, that is very easy for students to understand, they're easy to identify it. Now, if I were to add several more, because there are several areas of importance in this particular work, and it's important for students to understand that. But too much signals to too many different areas very overwhelming and so this basically reverts the point of the signaling learning principle and so by how by having multiple signals to multiple different areas or multiple different parts of the image or just multiple different signals in terms of gesturing circles and in voice inflection can tend to be overwhelming and so students might inadvertently start to 
zone out or start to ignore the signals and ignore the information. There, haven't, there hasn't been many studies into how much is too much because this is different for every student. Every student has a limit and every instructor has a limit on how many signals they want to use. So this is something that should be studied in the future in order to understand where is a good base threshold for how much signaling is too much signaling to utilize in the classroom. Now the issue of redundancy is a little more complicated to kind of understand because the issue of redundancy deals with students who have a high prior working knowledge of the information. And so this is a complicated subject because how do you understand or how do you evaluate if students have a high prior working knowledge or how do you cater to students with high prior knowledge if you have students with a low prior knowledge in your classroom. So traditionally high prior, high prior knowledge students are students who are familiar with the subject matter and so these students are used to this subject and so they're used to teaching this subject and so studies have indicated that students who have a high prior knowledge get irritated with the signals. So there isn't a good answer as to why students with high prior knowledge basically zone out when they're dealing with signaling, but it does, most likely it does revert back to frustration or irritation in the classroom. These are very real emotions that students feel and so this is something that students deal with and so if they are being shown something that they're very familiar with and if they're not provided with new information or the new information is not signaled then it basically is telling them that basically just regurgitating information that they already know and so if that you're not if they're not being provided with new information then just being signaled old information they will disengage with the subject. So students who are, and students who are not engaged are not learning. So we look at this example. So by now, after looking at this painting numerous times through this presentation, we have a good idea of kind of what is this painting and what's going on in this painting. So I could utilize signals and point to the Christ as the focal point or the four groups of three apostles that are working in this but this is all information that I have already provided to you throughout the course of this particular presentation so if I were to keep talking about these particular aspects of the painting then you as the audience will check out of this information and will get frustrated with dealing with these particular these particular signals. So it's important for the instructor to understand when to provide new information. And so new information that you can look into is kind of how the instruct how Leonardo da Vinci utilized different aspects of art to draw people into these particular scenes. And so how he utilized different facial expressions for each individual disciples so that they would be able to be recognized and would be able to people would be able to say this is this particular disciple this is this particular one but if I keep using these types of signals it typically relates to more redundancy so new information that could be analyzed with this particular image is that this particular painting originally had feet and so Christ originally had feet. This painting is located in the Santa Maria del, del Grazi in Milan. And so the monks who were there originally, originally when they were looking at this painting, they realized that they wanted a door in this particular wall. So they cut this part of the painting out. So this is or was a weather facing wall. Um, other aspects that are interesting for this work is the placement of hands in the scene with Judas and Christ in the very center. So the painting is in pretty bad condition, so this is a little grainy. But in this particular picture, you can see the hand of Christ reaching out to Judas's hand. Judas is the one who would betray him, and so betray him to the Romans. 
And so this is implying that Christ is offering forgiveness to Judas for Judas doing what he's going to do, and then Judas kind of retreating from that forgiveness as he's pulling his hand away. So this is new information provided through this particular through this particular painting. And so this is the type of information that should be utilized in order to avoid redundancy, in order to, in order to avoid students, use, students checking out of the subject matter with the signaling principle. So this type of information is useful for signaling, while information that is meant to be review for students to have high prior knowledge should not be signaled and should be provided as just straight baseline information. Now, what kind of conclusions can we draw about the signaling learning principle from this type of information? So the signaling learning principle is very useful in multimedia education, particularly for or just education in general, because educators have been utilizing it for a long time, possibly without even knowing, as they gesture and utilize voice inflections and try to get students engaged with the material. And it is a very useful type of principle because it does help with student engagement and it's able to translate into different media. So not only can you utilize it in the classroom, but you can utilize it in for video recordings or even just video tutorials that are available for students. However, like every learning material, it does have disadvantages and it's important for researchers to continue to examine these disadvantages and why they occur in order to perfect the signaling learning principle and how the signaling learning principle is utilized in the classroom. So as we continue to study this principle and continue to do research related to it, we will be able to understand more of the advantages and disadvantages it brings and how it impacts student engagement. That way we as educators can continue to build engagement and build instruction to encourage engagement to create student success in the educational environment. So thank you for following my presentation and I hope you have a excellent day.